blocker of Hextall. Fed around to the far side. Flyers a little lax in picking up uh, Robinson, who puts it cross-ice off the body. Breakaway Eklund. He's gone for the hat trick. He's in. Shot. Score! Hat trick, Pelly Eklund. That for Philadelphia in their history is their 12th playoff hat trick. And the other one this year, Tim Kerr against the Islanders in the first game of that set. Everybody, it's Isaiah, and I'm here with Chef B, who's going to tell us about one of our sponsors here. Chef? Yeah, OMB Podcast is now brought to you by Summit Public Adjusters. The winter months can be especially hard on our homes, from roof damage to peeling siding to frozen pipes and toilet overflows. Call Summit Public Adjusters before you call your insurance company. Dealing with your insurance company can be stressful and confusing. Let Summit Public Adjusters take the stress out of the clean process by having our guys work for you. Get the most for your money and your repairs. The next time the big snow or the rain leaves you with some home damage, contact us for a free consultation. Summit Public Adjusters are licensed in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Learn more at summitpublicadjusters.com or call 215-752-0560. Just tell them that the chef sent you. Yeah, what was that number again, chef? 215-752-0560. That's terrific. All right, we're going to carry on with the rest of our show. And we are back. It is the OMB Puckcast. I'm your host, Isaiah. And this is an OMB Puckcast special. And this is a real good one. Because uh, we're going to have a guest on who really knows a lot about this organization from the inside out. He's been following as long as we have, if not longer, the Philadelphia Flyers. And uh, this could be a new era for the team. And I think a lot of us are hoping that. So before we get rolling tonight, just want to talk to the panel members. The great Dan Silver is on a work assignment tonight. He regrets not being able to make it, but uh, he should be back for our next show. But of course, we do have, to my left as always, Chef to the left B. Hey, what's up, guys? I think Dan's, Dan gave us a heads up. He might be uh, at the game tomorrow night, but definitely Saturday as well. So looking forward to hearing first person uh, analysis of what, what's going on down there, what he sees, because Dan has a very good eye. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, some kids playing, and who knows who the Flyers are going to call up between now and then. So before we bring on our ex- ex- esteemed guests, just a reminder that the OMB podcast is on 12 podcast platforms. Uh, if you could rate, subscribe to the OMB podcast. It really helps us out because people look for Philadelphia Flyer podcasts and the more subscriptions that we have, it moves us up the charts, makes it easier for people to find us. So depending on your platform, we also have a YouTube page, a Facebook page, just plug in the OMB podcast. And of course we're on Twitter at OMB puck at OMB puck. We have a backup plan at getter at OMB Podcast, at OMB Podcast, and we certainly do appreciate your support. And of course, there's never any charge. And without any further ado, he is the founder of HockeyBuzz.com, and he is also quite often appearing on the Hockey Buzzcast, which is weekdays, Monday through Fridays. It's just one of the most complete sources of information about the NHL and hockey at large. His name is Eklund. How are you, man? Thanks, Isaiah. No, it's, it's good. I'm good. I'm good. It's nice to be talking flyers, you know, like, and I, uh, we do the hockey buzzcast. It's a whole league thing. So we got to be careful. You know, we can't, we can talk about the flyers for a little while because you got Russ on there and, you know, and me, of course. So, uh, but yeah, this is, this is nice. This is nice to just be talking to this organization. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, you're well equipped to do that. I mean, before you came on, I was talking to Chef about how, you know, you had the, the Flyers historian, the late, great uh, Jay Greenberg writing on your site. Uh, Scoop Cooper is up there. 
uh, one occasion. And then, you know, I guess Jay's heir apparent, uh, Bill Meltzer has been there almost from the very beginning. Oh, yeah. So, and, and you have had contacts within the organization for many, many years, and including uh, you, we were talking, uh, Ed Snyder himself. So, yeah, I, I, I was uh, really yeah. close with that. I was really close with that. And, um, you know, he, um, he liked uh, what I did during the lockout year when that was not going on, you know, trying to help. I, I tried to do some behind the scenes things to get the players and owners talking to each other because I knew some players, I knew some owners. Um, and uh, so we ended up, we ended up hitting it off really well. And he would have my wife and I down to the, to the games to sit in his press box or go out to dinner. And uh, it was, it was pretty funny because, you know, as reporters, it was, it, was, it was kind of awkward. The first time I was, you know, always on the press box for the flyers after games so I'd be in the, in the locker room with them. So then it, about midway through that first season, Ed invites me to a game. And so he, before the before the press goes into the locker room, Ed would go into the locker room and like shake everybody's hands, and look at the players' hands and say, hey, you know. So he says, come with me. And I'm like, I can't really, I'm not supposed to. He's like, no, you're with me. So it was really just like one of those really incredibly awkward moments for a new writer as I passed by the Tim Pinaccio's of the world and stuff like that. I said, okay. <laughs> but uh, it was really awkward. But he, Tim, Ed, I, learned, I learned a lot about what made Ed tick. And uh, I think... He was quite a fascinating, quite a fascinating individual for sure. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, we're going to explore a little bit of that tonight. Uh, I think, I think what compelled me to to want to have you on, besides the fact that you know I, I had been on your site for a very long time, and God, I, I started with uh, well, hockey buzz started what in, in, in 06, around that time. Started in the year where we had no hockey. Yeah, <laughs> um, it, it started. I mean, that, that's when. Well, that's when I had a blog on Blogspot, and then that, the the year okay. where we actually had hockey was when Hockey Bus started. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, for, for the time flies. But in, in that true. interval, the the Flyers have kind of closed one era when they had that horrible season of seven, and I think they've closed another era. You know, yeah. and I, I think when you go back in the history of the team. You had the early years, yeah. and then, of course, when Fred Shiro gets hired, that's really when things started happening. Yep. And that you had the cup years, and even after Shiro left, maybe through the 1983, when Clark and Barber finally stepped down, and then, and then that era kind of yeah. ended with, uh, with Mike Keenan and Bob Clark as the GM. And I mean, what's your feeling about how you separate these different eras really, as we cross really our fun, fingers you know, here? It's really fun. The one thing they always had was a goalie, right? They always had a good goalie. And which is, which is ironic to new hockey, new Flyers fans, you know, because that's yeah. when you, when we, when we were kids watching them, you know, they had, I went from Bernie Perrant to, uh, you know, who was just unbelievable, you know? Um, and then, you know, along comes, you know, Pelly Lindbergh, Ron Hextall, just, and it was always just, they were always top in goalies. And you never had to worry about the goalie position on the Flyers. And that was always the one thing to do. I mean, as good as they were in the Broad Street Police, it was all, you know, they don't win that cup without Bernie Perron. No questions asked. Yeah. I and mean, that cup was Bernie Perron's cup. Um, they won the game one nothing. It's all you needed to know. You know, they, 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 that's how they won. So, so that, those areas did intercept. You're right. Like the, that, that Broad Street Bullies era intercepted with like the streak team, like 35 game undefeated streak right. of 79 80. And that goes that that's the that's the pull in prop um, tocket beginning of that beginning of that type era, and right. uh, and yeah, and, and then it, it goes you know then it then it slips into some weird times in the late eighties the Ron Hop, Ron Flackhart era, <laughs> Lenny Hackborn, Ron Flackhart, the high speed line Ray Allison, remember that hockey hockey, hockey hockey, but that was that was exciting at least you know we loved it, yeah, and yeah, and that could, and then you know then the Lindros era of course, and and but since when the Lindros era ended, since then I really felt like a definite disconnect like that's when the goalie problem started you know first of all and that's when you know they went through goalie after goalie after goalie um and uh yeah and and that you know the new era like you know we had the mike richards jeff carter era kind of you know for a brief period of time that ended weirdly because they pissed off ed snyder and then you <laughs> end up um getting into this like you know into, into what we have now which you know probably was you know i mean that that richards carter thing highlighted you know with 2010 going to the stanley cup finals and the freak run but now we have what you have now, you know, and uh, I mean, I we lived through all those teams that lost the Edmonton Oilers <laughs> in the eighties in Stanley cup finals, you know, and that was the, uh, that was the end of the streak era kind of. So yeah, it, it, was, it was, there was a lot of different fun eras, you know, and but the one thing they always had in common was like, there was a Flyers hockey that you could put your finger on. Like you can still put your finger on Bruins hockey. Like right now, Bruins are still the Bruins. There always will be the Bruins. It seems like there, there is a Bruins hockey. There's a Rangers hockey. Um, there was a Flyers hockey, but I think that, Really, you know, even before Ed passed, you know, that was starting to 
go away and that they had to stop kind of following what they had, what had made them, what had ingratiated them to their fans. And what, you know, which is not about fighting. It was more about hard work. You know, it really was more about hard work because the Flyers of the last 10 years can be defined by falling behind, you know, like <laughs> in, in, in first periods. How many times, I mean, how many times were they behind? How many times did they give up the first goal, right? In the last 10 years. Yeah. And, that, and the Flyers that we remember as kids always scored first. They would come out, they would come out flying, hitting and pounding, and they would score. So somewhere that got lost. And and I think the, the, the battle to try to get that back is what they're doing right now. It's where they're, where they're at right now. And uh, I don't know how quickly they can get it back, but I do think some of the stuff that Tortorella has done has been towards it in a way, but not, you know, but, but you know, the stuff Fletcher did was kind of, uh, kind of crazy <laughs> in a lot of ways. So I think that's where they, I think that's where they, you know, Fletcher did the same thing that the Minnesota Wild did to the Flyers. And, you know, it, it's, it's a carbon copy, you know. So to me, you know, the, the, the biggest mistake for this team right now was that they interviewed Fletcher and they interviewed Bill Zito at the same time for that GM job. They hired Fletcher and they decided not to bring Zito in for an interview, for a second interview, because they wanted to hire Fletcher. And, um, and now, you know, what, what happened, you know, Zito goes on and takes the Florida Panthers to, uh, you know, a president's trophy and, really turns that team into a, into a competitive team. And, uh, and they're still, I mean, they're having an off year this year, but they're kind of learning how to play in the playoffs. They're learning different things. So, and they could make, if they make the playoffs, the Panthers could be trouble, but, uh, but they play a lot like the Flyers used to play. The Panthers do, you know, they really do. They're, they're a tough team. They're a tough team to play against and they're, and they're a physical team. They're, you know, they, they score and they fly and uh, yeah. And Fletcher didn't take them in that direction. So I think that's that to me, that's like a pivotal moment. If I could just draw one pivotal moment to where we are right now. Yeah, I mean, one's a visionary, and right. and, 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 Z, and Zito, the ex agent. Yeah. That that's I think that's part of it. And one's a mediocre, yeah. who kind of, yeah. you know, piggybacked off his his father's uh, accomplishments, and also the fact that he was very well regarded. He's he's a uh, he's a he's quite the gentleman, he's and a great he's guy. very well regarded. But Absolutely. he's he's a mediocre, right? He's a great guy, and he, and he's a and he's a classic hockey guy. You know, like he is. He feels like hockey when you talk to him. He feels like he just brings back, like, yeah, he's hockey. But, but like you said, innovation, like, you know, all the trades that Bill Zito had made when he first went down to Florida, he turned the team completely around and, made, and brought different players in. And, and, and you know, the, the trade this summer, getting, you know, moving Huberto, which is like a gutsy move that we would never have seen a Flyers coach ever do something like that. A Flyers GM ever do something like that. Back, actually, the last time that happened was when they traded Recky for Lynn Russ. Right, oh, okay, Recky for, Recky for the Claire and Desjardins. That was the last time the Flyers made that great, you know, which which turned that which turned that team around. So, um, yeah, we were there was nothing innovative. There were no, you know, they didn't, you know, the Hextel era was great for development. You know, the, 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 as a GM, Hextel's GM, he developed a lot of good young players, but he was afraid to trade his picks and prospects away, and he didn't tell anybody what he was doing. So he made the Flyers upper media insane. Like he he really did. Like he, because Hextel was like. Trust me, I'm the GM. I got, what's the plan? Trust me, I'm the GM. I got this. I got this. You know, and they did, he, that, that was Hextall's MO, you know, and uh, it, was, uh, it was tough. It was tough on them. I think by the end with Ron Hextall, it was the plan seemed to be more important than the team, Chef. Yeah, I was just wondering. It, you, you, you said, I, I know you knew Ed well. So yeah. I was just thinking the, the current pivot on this team, at least what he's seen so far, uh, you know, with, yeah. What he would think about Danny taking over, but also more importantly, what he what what he sees in this team. You think he would he would like this team? I mean, I, I tweeted out at least yeah. I know they're not winning, and I know that they don't have any high end talent. But this coach has got these kids and the, some of the veterans really believing that yes. they're in games, and they are in games until right. they pull a goalie with two minutes left and they get scored three times or whatever. Yeah, right, right, but right, I mean, right. <laughs> but okay. I mean. So do you think he Ed would have been like, oh yeah, Torts is my kind of guy, and yes. I, I think Danny Danny's going to do a great job. I got a lot of faith in him. I mean, uh, as Flyers fans as well, you know, uh, even on the podcast, you know, I know we do all this, but we're we're still fans at heart. We want this team to do well, and I was just wondering your opinion of what Ed would think about this. Hey, he would love Tortorella, no questions asked. He would love him. They, they would they would fight like cats and dogs, the two of them. They would they would be at each other's throats and probably publicly at times. You know, <laughs> would be surprised. <laughs> you know, but he still he would take a fighter over. You know, 
it, you know, like the, like to play Hamilton, you know, like if you've ever seen Hamilton, you know, where he talks about Aaron Burr does, you know, if you don't stand for anything, what do you stand for? You know, and he wants someone to stand. It's Torrell stands yeah. for them. Regardless of whether you hate him or like him, he's, he's, he, he has a thing and that is his thing. And that's what he does, you know? And um, Ed loves that. Ed, Ed, Mike Keenan was that way. You know, Ed liked that. Um, Laviolette was that way. So, the, you know, Briere, he would love Briere as a GM. It, it, it's very, it reminds me a lot of Bobby Clark when he would put in as a GM. You know, we all thought that Bobby Clark's not really ready to be a GM yet for the Flyers, but, you know, suddenly he, he, did, he had success, like, right away as a GM. Um, and Briere, you know, you don't, you think at first, you know, he doesn't have that much experience, but he is incredibly smart, Briere. And he's also, you know, very savvy to media and just comes off better to fans than, you know, than Fletcher would, you know, like, so yeah. when Briere talks, it's going to come off like more sincere. He's very, Briere is incredibly sincere. I've had lunch with him several times and he's just incredibly sincere when you talk to him. He is what you, he is what you see. That's what he is. You know, it's not, there's nothing different with him. I think he's a great, great choice. Now, you know, he needs help. But in, but in this day and age in the NHL, it is kind of a committee for general manager. You know, you have your capologists and you have your, you know, your people like that, but Briere knows hockey, he knows players. And he, uh, and he, he especially knows, you know, when you think of Briere, what do you think of? You think of his success in the playoffs, right? Like his, his like unbelievable ability to rise to another level in the playoffs. That's what, that's what he's going to ask this team to do. You know? Yeah. I think, I think also too, it, it, that just from the one or two times he spoke publicly now, there are a few times he has, he, it seems he's got this ood of confidence. He yeah. exudes it. And, and it's just out there. And it's nothing like what we've seen from Chuck Fletcher, who oh, sometimes is stammering and stuff. It, it, it Chuck seemed like more like somebody who was nervous about making the wrong decision, whereas Danny comes across, I'm I'm making the right decision, yeah. and I'm gonna and even if I don't, you're you're gonna believe that I am just the way I carry myself. So that's that's true. That's really and and that, that's huge, you know. I mean, because there's a perception is reality type thing to a lot of this, you know. And when Fletcher did his YouTube, you know, when you watch you, Fletcher do a press conference on YouTube and you see the comments scrolling up, which was unbelievable, the Flyers would allow that to happen in the first place. But when you would see this comment scrolling up. <laughs> It was like, uh, come on, guys. You know, like, that's not – Fletcher, that's not where he's, – he's, he's smart. He's a good hockey guy. He's been around for a long time. But this is not this is not his his best thing to do. You don't want to put him in front of a crowd. You know, like, this is not the guy you want in front of a crowd. Briere, you do. Briere, you want in front of the crowd. He's going to be – he's going to help with that a lot. Yeah, I mean, by the end, uh, uh, Chuck was a pod person. I mean, he was, he was out there delivering messages uh, that – I'm not sure he believed. And then right. what he said he actually believed, you didn't know. It was like the you know the boy who cried wolf yeah. with the aggressive retool. It was obvious when Tortorella started, uh, you know, pitching a contrasting narrative that <laughs> well, wait a minute, one of these things is not like the other, and there was a clear yeah. divide. And then of course we heard from Friedman and Marek this week that there were executives letting out the um, with each particular move. That yep. uh, hey, that's I didn't put my name on that one. You know whether it's right. Ristolainen or, or or the D'Angelo. You it's know what I'm saying? Ridiculous. Like all of it was coming apart. It is ridiculous that the people have come out and said that kind of stuff, even privately. You know, like that's something that Ed would never have allowed to happen either. I mean, but don't don't think for a second that Ed Snyder and you know Paul Holmgren and all these guys got along beautifully all the time. They didn't, but they weren't ever when they made a decision. I mean, we all know that Monarch was Ed's choice. But it was never, you never heard Paul say that. You know, you never hear Homer, and Homer say, I had to sign Chickamatic. He took credit for the Chickamatic signing, you know, and that was the deal, right? So those things, um, you know, you have to. And Bruce Gallup, for that matter. And I'm, actually, I meant Bruce Gallup. I'm sorry. I meant Bruce Gallup. I was thinking that as I was just oh, saying. Okay. That. So, uh, yeah, I'm getting old here. But um, yeah, that's that's exactly that. That's what, you know, he wanted Bruce Gallup from, you know, he wanted Stanley Cup, and it, you know, as part of that duo in, in, in um, Anaheim. So, yeah, I really, um, I agree. I agree. I mean, I, I think that. This they, they, they can't be there. There has to be an organization. I think Briere will tighten it up a lot more. I think Briere will tighten the circle a lot closer. Um, the, the circle and in, in, it's gotten way out of hand. Like it used to be even guys like Peter Luco, who were really good at keeping things tight. He's gone, you know, so Sean Tilger. Is was that a turning point? Though? Was that a turning point, though, when he left? Because I know Ed was very surprised by that, or, or at least that's what he said publicly. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, Peter wanted to be like the president, of, you know, he wanted to be, you know, to, to basically have Ed's job, you know, and it was never going to happen really until Ed passed away. And that was a tough spot for Peter to be in, I think. Um, Peter's incredibly smart. 
um, really good at building building buildings. You know, like he his stadium his stadiums he built all around the you know North America and you know and helped put together. He was just incredibly smart, but also a, also a hockey guy. You know, like a flat out hockey guy. He knew hockey. His sons played in very high competitive hockey. Was one son got drafted by the Flyers, um, nice. and uh, so yeah, Peter and even somebody like Sean Tilger, who was always like you know kind of I don't know how many dealings you guys had with Sean Tilger, but he's another great guy who who always had like he he knew. The, he knew what the what being a flyer was. He knew what Ed wanted being a flyer to be, and that that was really important. You know, like um, I'll give you like a small example of this. So I had a show that was called Flyer Buzz TV. It was briefly on Comcast Sportsnet. We did like ten episodes, and I interviewed a bunch of people driving around the back. They were in the back of my van, and I just I just took them around the city, and we talked about things. And one then the Flyers were on a losing streak. I was supposed to have like I forget Jeff Carter or something like that, and Hitchcock Hitchcock was the coach at the time, and he, he took him out and said. They kept him on the road. They didn't bring him home. So I had nobody to interview that day. So I went to the, I went to the fans and I got Claude Giroux, who was like, who was not quite, who was just coming in. It was the first interview he ever did with the Flyers. He was really nervous. So he's driving around the back of my car. Um, and he was great, but he wore a Yankees hat the whole time. This because this is just what he did. You know, as a kid, whatever. I had to redo the whole thing because there was no way that Sean or Ed would allow, allow a Yankees hat to be to be worn by a flyer. <laughs> That's all. And I was like, Are you, you gotta be kidding me. He's like, no, 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 no. And that, but you see something, but the detail, the details like that yeah. are what is, what's gone away. Like that, that, that's a small detail. And at the time I was angry because I'm, oh man, I got I feel terrible. I have to ask Claude to do this again. Right. But, but I got it because it's like those little details were what Peter and Sean sort of made sure okay, stay true. And Holmgren tried his best to do that as well. And, and I know, I know, that Ed told Homer at the end, you got to keep this, you got to keep the flyers, the flyers and Homer tried as hard as he could do that, but it got exhausting because of Comcast above and all the different things, all the different corporation aspects of it. it, it, it Homer just couldn't, it just, just wore him down. Yeah. Yeah. Chef. I have uh, now with, with Briere, are, I mean, are you a hundred, are you a hundred percent sold that he's going to be the GM or is he going to be the president? Or do you think, I think the GM suits him a little better and yeah. perhaps they go outside and find a president that has more upside experience. And yeah. I know there's names out there and I'll let you float whatever you want to float. You're comfortable doing, but yeah. I was just curious. I, I, I'm thinking that Briar stays as the GM. I know he's got the interim, you know, tagged right yeah. now, but I think they're going to make that it probably permanent after first couple of weeks after the season's over. I think, yeah, I think they will too. Um, but I do think this will be more of a, um, you know, kind of what you see in Vancouver, you know, where you have a GM and a president who's, you know, everyone's saying who's Rutherford going to you know, trade in Vancouver and he's not the GM, you know, he's the, he's the, he's, so you can, you'll get, I think you can get an experienced guy in here. Um, like how about like, um, I was like a Ray Shiro, like, you know what I mean? A Ray, Ray Shiro is a good name, I think. And he, he you know, he did, he, you know, the Penguins obviously did a couple Stanley Cups. If you brought Ray Shiro in to be like the hockey ops guy and stuff like that, Briere to be the face of the team and be the GM working together. That that's sort of the way the NHL works now. And, and and I think both of those guys, you know, you're also talking about something that will appeal to the Flyers fans because it's Ray Shiro. You know, and and not every Flyers fan, of course, alive now remembers who the heck Fred Shiro was. But, you know, he was the one who brought the Stanley Cup to Philadelphia. Um, that matters. And Ray Shiro grew up in Philadelphia, grew up around, you know, the around the around the Flyers. That's his dream job. So I think that would be a good person to put with Briere. I think that would be a killer combo. I think one of the concerns I had is that even though Danny worked real hard at understanding the business side of it and going to Maine and actually doing being more of a yeah. hockey ops guy in, in, in Maine, and he mentioned the experiences he had had with Joe Sackick and in Montreal – Who's the guy? Just uh, Bergeron. Bergeron, Got yeah. Uh, yeah, and some of the other GMs. And I think that I, you know, I, I think of the Phillies, and yeah. the <laughs> the Flyers bring in a guy like Hextall. Hextall had pedigree. He had been here. Then he went to LA. They won a couple cups, and he comes back here, and he had a plan. And what he ended up doing is choking the life out of the organization in a lot of ways. Because what I thought he was a little bit of a megalomaniac. And yeah. and a little bit too much of a control freak. And you 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 talked about like how he didn't yeah. you know he didn't feed the beast a little bit on the ice. He was more worried about the abstract, and it just caught yeah. up with them. Yeah. Uh, and I think that was really the beginning of the Flyers losing who they were. 
yeah. then you bring in Fletcher. And I'm just thinking they need someone who's pedigreed with success. And, and Shiro can check that box. His right. 2009 Penguins uh, yeah. were, you know, cup winners. And in 2008, of course, the year before that, they went to the cup and almost uh, beat the uh, yeah. the Red Wings who won that year. And then, of course, the Devils, you, you could put a lot of players on that current Devil squad, which is so impressive, that have, you know, ratios imprint. Absolutely. So, I mean, that I mean, that's certainly something there. But we definitely want someone who's a who can show Danny the ropes in areas you can only learn through experience. You know, and that's yeah. that's what I'm concerned about. Is there, well, there is, is, it, is it, there a, it makes sense? You know, like I mean, and and your concern is not is not unvalid. But I do I can ease it a little bit by saying that Danny is incredibly smart hockey wise, like way more smart than players usually are. And and it, and, and even when he was a player, when you talk to him even during the lockout and things like that, and different, different things when you talk to him about like negotiations that were going on, you know, we talk off the record about different things. It's like, yeah, he, he's, he's just a, one of those sharp, he's a, he's a very, very smart guy. And there's a reason he was a finalist for the Montreal GM job too. Um, you know, right. before he almost got that job. And I know, you know, talking to him at the time, he, he how could you say no to the GM of the Montreal Canadiens, but he wanted this one. He wanted to be a GM of the Flyers, not the Montreal Canadiens. Um, this is this he loved he loved playing here and he loves his family loved being here he loves you know sure he's loves you know Longport he loves you know where all the different things and this is where he, lo he loves he loves the town and he loved playing here so this was his dream you know and he wanted to do this he is smarter than your average bear but you're right in terms of the fact that you know there are definitely things he's going to have to learn and that is why he went to Maine but you know it's still it's, it's not it's not the NHL right so there's a lot of things you need an NHL. You need some guy with NHL experience. Like maybe it's a Dean Lombardi. I don't know. Maybe it's a Dean Lombardi who comes in as a president. Um, he's always around the Flyers. He's been part of the Flyers for a long time. He's also won Stanley Cups. You know, he's he's there too. Um, personally, I'm a more of a Shiro fan than a Lombardi fan, but that's just personal. Uh, either one would be a perfect kind of like been there, done that, experienced guy that could that could that could work with Briere in tandem, kind of. What about a guy who? has kind of like a varied experience like Danny and whose name's been out there like uh, Chris Pronger uh, or even Robert Ash, who's, you know, the goalie in 2004, who's been running Utica in the AHL yeah. for 10 years. Yeah, so, both are really, both are obviously smart people too. Yeah. I mean, both are smart guys. I don't think Ash would be, I don't think they would bring in Ash though. Um, but I think that they could bring, I, mean, I like Robert Ash a lot. He's a great guy. Um, but um Chris Pronger, I mean, you guys know, like when you talk to Chris Pronger, he is definitely, <laughs> he is a force. Like he, he does command the room. Like he's just, he's a guy who, I remember the first time I met him, he was on the blues. I was really nervous to meet him because, but it, he really wanted to meet me. So Andy Strickland, who's down there in St. Louis, like who was writing for at the time, says, you got to come meet Pronger and Kachuk. All right. So I had to go back. I went and met, met these guys. They both want to know who Eklund was. So I go back <laughs> in the room with him and I'm talking to them and, uh, Pronger just like shakes your hand and his hand just envelops your hand, you know, like he's like, you're like, Hey, hello, Chris. You know, like, it's like, he's really, really tall. And he just had that presence. And he's like, so you're Eklund. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was really like, uh, pretty terrified. He definitely is commanding. Um, I don't think he's as hockey sharp as Briere. Um, and I don't think you'd want to have two of those. I don't think you want two X players. I think, I think, you know, it, 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 now if, you know, if they go away from Briere for some reason, I, but it feels like they're not, like you said, because I think that, I think they're going to stay with Briere because he's kind of somebody that everybody loves. Like all of Comcast loves him. The Flyers organization loves, like there's a, he really does a good job. And he was, he did a good job with, with not with being there for Fletcher and not throwing Fletcher under the bus either. He was respectful of Fletcher too. So he was really good in general. Well, let me ask you, like, when you say Comcast loves them and all, that's kind of changing, too. It's like, let's get into a little bit, like, yeah. the Dan Hilferty, Dave Scott dynamic, where does Val Camillo fit in? And what about the advisors like Clark, Barbara Holmgren, and Dean Lombardi? And, and like, yeah. what do you think that know you, and how is that going to change going forward? <laughs> it's got to be. It's got to change. Is that a loaded um, question or what? <laughs> it's a very yeah, you, stole, you stole my question, so there. Yeah, it's, it's, there I was going to answer that too. That me, it's a question that will get me kicked out of the press box if I answer it properly. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try to figure out how to answer <laughs> that question. Can. No, but I, I, you're right, and it, there are too many cooks in the kitchen, right? Mm -hmm. um, the Flyers, <laughs> I like the fact the Flyers have old people around, like you know Clark, who's just funny 
just a really funny guy. Whenever I see him, he just laughs at me. It's the funniest thing. I'm on the elevator. I'm like, hey, but Clark, he's like, <laughs> <laughs> so weirdo um <laughs> just a strange guy um but anyway so you know but but homer is great you know and you know and lombardi this group of you know these curmudgeon type people running around the press box up there um you know the cranky old hockey players and then they then the suits you know like the comcast guys who are like basically you know the guys who know how to do presentations and things like that but they're not necessarily hockey people um, but you know, they, but they, but they can, they can tell you the benefits of having A and E on your cable subscription network. So, I mean, it's just like, it's the, the, they're not, I mean, and they're not, not hockey people, but like, what is Dave Scott's, you know, what is he like, as far as a hockey person goes, like, and I, and I mean, I can't think of another, he's really just that he's, he's, he's speaking for an entity that's Comcast. It's a tough spot. I don't, I don't envy him. <laughs> it's a tough spot to be in because I think he does realize that he's in a no win situation in a way. Um, because he's not really like a respected hockey person, but he also, but he t- gets up there and talking like, yeah, we're going to make trades. We're going to do this, this, this. It's like, but you know, all of us have the qualifications to say that as much as he does, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's a tough spot. I, I, so yeah. How are they going to blend that? And it seems like that's what they really want to do. And the problem here is Comcast is in charge. <laughs> so yes. if one, if one of those sides is going, it's not going to be the Comcast side. Me, I've tried to go fund me to start uh, to buy out the team back, but I'm up to twelve dollars and seventy two cents. So if you want to donate, just go to Chef to Left B, inbox me. I'll tell you where to send it. But you don't even uh, get your HBO on your Comcast network. I know, I know, I know. It's horrible <laughs> for one month. Just, yeah. So, but yeah, yeah. I, I I get it. I understand what you're saying. It's tough. I, I they're Scott, the owners, and the owners are the owners. Yeah, Dave Scott. Um, um, yeah, Jim Carrey. They were afraid. I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt, Isaiah. Sorry to interrupt, but they were afraid yeah, of us. Comcast was afraid of Ed Snyder. Ed Snyder intimidated them. So they let him be. I mean, and they knew that they couldn't sit there and say, Ed, this is not, if the Ed, Ed we, yeah, what are you doing to our team? They, you never heard them say that to Ed Snyder, even though they own, they bought the team. It was Ed's team still, you know, and there was no way they were going to get away with that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, and they knew that, and they knew that Ed would lose it. So that, that you know, sometimes that little angst of is a good thing, you know? So yeah. I don't know. Anyway, sorry. It's, it's called pushback. And, and I think, yeah. yeah, it's one of the reasons why somebody like Pronger and having someone strong. And, you know, I mean, Ray Shure is a strong guy, too. So and, and he, he's just going to have a different way. There's different ways to push back. A lot of different ways to skin the cat. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, I could definitely see that. I mean, I was hoping for somebody like a Mike Buda, a Mark Yanetti from the L.A., uh, Kings, or I, I even be on board with a guy like Tolsky, who is obviously putting jigsaw p- pieces together uh, in Carolina, where they've avoided having to go after the big free agent for the most part. And that's yeah. a, certainly a better way to put, to put together a long, you know, a, a, a team Waddell. together. Don Waddell is a lot like Danny Briere. You know, he's a lovable guy. He's, he's, a, he's a general manager, but he has people out there helping him in different situations. You know, Don Waddell will go into a concourse and talk to fans before every game. You'll see him out there walking around. He's done that since he was in Atlanta. You'll, uh, you'll see Danny doing that. Danny will do that too, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, right, because now that was the guy that always remembers we, we got Kobe for Alexi Shitnik. And, I, I, you know, that he was uh, tarred by that trade, but he lost a lot of respect. But in a, but it was a, like a no-win situation there right, in right. Atlanta. You know? Right, you right, know, it was. The first no, sign was already out, you know. Yeah, he, and he, he did the best he could to get the best he could, you know. And um, and he he's held that job begrudgingly at times. Like, he didn't necessarily want to be the GM. He wanted to be the president of the team. But he's, you know, the owner there is a totally different. Now, the owner there is like, more like what we have with an Ed Snyder type owner. Like he is a hundred percent like, and you know, the, the, the closest thing we have to Ed Snyder right now is what you have in Vegas. Vegas is yeah. incredible. That guy is just like Ed. Like I met both, I met him too. That's why Vegas is going for it all the time. Like they're, they're, they're going out there and they're making trades. They're going to, you know, they're going to, they're going to hell with a few, you know, he wants to win a Stanley cup. He's 80 years old. He wants to win a Stanley cup. He doesn't care about the guys they're drafting now because he's not going to be alive when they get made it to the NHL. He just wants <laughs> to be, he wants, and I, that's horrible to say, but he wants to win. He got, he, you know, he got close, incredibly close his first year, um, but he's and, he's, and he's built a team that's probably pretty powerful. And that's why I knew they were going to get Jonathan Quick. There was no question. And don't t- so tell me, Jonathan Quick would have been a flyer. At it. There, you could see that scenario perfectly playing out that Jonathan Quick is a guy that Ed Snyder gets. Ed Snyder makes them get it at the, at the, at the trade deadline. They don't have a goalie here. This is one Stanley Cups. That's an Ed Snyder move if I've ever seen it. You know, like yeah. that was 100% where, you know, and, and, that, and fans love that because you're going for it. You know, you're going for it. And 
we don't know. Prospects are shots in the dark. You know, like I fight with Russ coming about this all the time, but they are shots in the dark. Yeah. I'll take a guy who's won a couple Stanley Cups, you know? Well, yeah, yeah, I, I can certainly understand that, especially if you have the right guy in charge, Chef. I, I think w- with Philadelphia, and you can, you can both attest to this, I said, we're, we're, if the fans are, I think, are one of the smartest in sports. Yeah. They really get, really, it's been, and Flyers fans are even, even more integrated into that. I think you'll bear more forgiveness. I think the old, what is it? Uh, yes, I'd rather yeah, beg for true. forgiveness than ask for permission type of thing. They want to see you go for it. And if you, if you swing and you miss, at least you tried to hit it. You know what look, I mean? Look at the Phillies. Whereas, you know, look at yeah. what the Phillies have done. The Phillies have done exactly. that. Exactly. That's exactly what they've done, you know, and the, and the Eagles did it too, you know, basically. But, you know, the Eagles made so many great moves and spent a lot of money, and, you know. And, yeah, if you swing and you miss, you miss. Yeah, you and shot. they're doing it again. It looks like they're getting ready to swing and miss, or, well, at least swing again. We'll see if they miss, but they haven't given up. And I think the as fans, I think they are they feel like, I can speak for the base here, that we're, we're insulted that you're not, that, that yeah. it's not even being tried, all right? right. So now it fin- finally with, change of uh, the the regime here that Isaiah was noting. Uh, I, I think now they're feeling like, okay, maybe I, I, I'm going to give them a chance again. I, I think they're coming back slowly. You see, there's more chatter on Twitter, more positive chatter than there's ever been. Of course, yeah. they all want them to tank, you know, yeah. the, Bedard, the Bedard sweepstakes or whatever you want to call it. You know, because you go down to the games and when the Flyers score, people cheer. Yeah. You know, it's like at the end of the <laughs> so they, they You can't help it. You, you want your team to win, yeah. but – they're rooting for a game like last night. Great effort, yeah, exactly. comeback, ball just right. short, and you see kids developing, and it's it's not a complete right. and then loss. Like, like, you know. sellers, it was a beautiful, unbelievable goal. You know, there's, 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 that, you want to see those things. You want to see your young players making great plays. You know, like and um, yeah, I agree with you completely. Um, there have been two moments, Jeff, that have been exactly that, that summarize your points in the last um, what is it, uh, thirteen months? So. That, that, that Ed would have done differently, that, that, that the Flyers didn't do. First yeah. of all, Claude Giroux would never have been traded. Not in a million years. They wouldn't have traded Claude Giroux. Um, they would have, he, Ed would have made him a permanent Flyer. He would have figured out something. He would have talked to him. He would have given him something else that we probably wouldn't even know what it was. Some house somewhere or something like probably totally illegal. <laughs> he would have given him something. He would have made, he would have said, Claude, or he would have given him a, a guaranteed job in the front office when he retires. He would have, he would have retired Claude Giroux as, because as, Claude Giroux was the epitome of an Ed Snyder Flyer. That's, that, and he was the last of them. And he didn't want to leave, but he, you know, he had no choice. So, I mean, he, he did want to play in Ottawa because if he had to play somewhere else, because he was from there, but he'd rather have stayed here. And Johnny Goudreau would have been signed in a heartbeat. And that's the other, that's, that's, those are the two moves that Ed would have done differently. Now you can debate those, whether you think those are right or wrong, but they're both going for it moves. You know, they're both like, because Claude, as we see, still has game left. <laughs> he's, he's still a very, very good player. And we saw other players like, you know, stay in Philadelphia when they were maybe not as great as they once were, but still were very, very good for a long time, you know, and Gaudreau thought he was coming here. He was, he was the Flyers. Oh, yeah. Totally yeah. So yeah, that, those are the, that, that situation, the fact that, 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 that Gaudreau was, isn't here. Cause I know his family personally, like his, my best friend coached, coached him as a youth hockey player in South Jersey. Um, so yeah, I just, I completely, that would have happened. So yeah, there's like going for it moves that they're not doing. Yeah, I mean, personally, I would not have wanted that. If I can trace back to my days uh, when I was regular uh, on Hockey Buzz, that I wanted the Flyers to adopt like the uh, Detroit Red Wings model that was successful, ended up being for like yeah. a quarter of a century. And I think right yeah. now, I think that's kind of what people are hoping is going to happen. It's hockey. It's 2023. The days are just going for stuff. Like yeah. when you don't really have a lot of draft capital or you don't have a lot of young players that are at least a certain star, certain, you know, a tier right. level, it's, it's, it can be reckless and you end up in a situation like Vancouver and you, yeah. you've kind of done that. And, but believe me, I hear you. I, I hear you, but it, it, it could it, have been a trade. It's, it's, it's a really good debate because there's, you're both there. Neither of us is wrong or right. Because it's, it's honestly one of those situations, like what Claude does, if he stays here is he's, keeps that thing going, he, you know, here's a guy who learned how to play every shift because Yarmir Yager taught him how to do it. 
you know, right. that's how, you know, and th those things, those little things matter to have around a hockey team. You know, when you get a guy out there, it's like, go, you do this, you know? Um, and you know, the first round draft pick that they got, which I can't believe that they got that, that was probably Fletcher's best trade. Honestly, the fact that he got one of them. You, yeah. That in Michigan you know, trade, look, at yeah. What Patrick Kane, look at what the Rangers got. I mean, look at what the Hawks got for Patrick Kane versus what the Flyers got for Claude Giroux. You know, like that was like, I mean, there was, Claude was only going to Florida. That was the only place he was going. Just like this is only that. Just like you know, so th that was incredible. That you got that Florida threw a first round draft again. That was, I'm not a Zito fan, but I wasn't a fan of that from his perspective. But you know, but Claude, but you keep a guy like that around, and it keeps Flyers hockey tradition going. And, and he he teaches Joel Farabee and tra and and Travis Konechny how to play. You know, and that that matters, even though he's not. You know, that matters over the first round draft picks potential and things like that. In my book. You know, if he's not, if he's got nothing left in his game, that's one thing. Flood, Flood is like he's showing this year. He's showing him like an eighty-point season. So, yeah, and, and the, like you said, there's the other argument of like, well, let's see what happened with Jerome McGinley. If Calgary moves on from him, which they inevitably did, maybe it could have gone a little smoother in the intervening years. Maybe not. You know, maybe it could have even actually been worse. Every one of those players who played with Jerome McGinley in Calgary will tell you that you're wrong. <laughs> even you know, for as long as he stayed there, you know, like. Like when Peter Forsberg got traded to the Nashville Predators, remember that trade from the Flyers? Yes. He was only he was only in Nashville for like a month and a half because the, the, the trade deadline was so late, and the Predators only went one round. Um, right. But the, I've talked to players on the Predators who say that they learned more in that month and a half from Peter Forsberg than they have any other player they've ever played with about how to about how about how to show up at the arena. So what those guys do, even if they're not killing it on statistically, matters a lot. And I, you know, I think that's going to have, a, that's going to be a big motivation and maybe a, a less than obvious payoff of having Sean Couturier here if he can make it back, because he's going to yeah. bring a lot of those qualities. Chef? I've often said, and I've said it on other radio shows I've been on and other podcasts I've been on, you can never under, underestimate what a great rah-rah guy does in your locker room. Yeah. And, and, and I throw that and I encapsulate that with what you, you your guy, what, what you were just saying. Yeah. It doesn't have to be like, hey, let's go get one for the Gipper type of thing. Yeah. It's those guys that lead by example to show you, hey, hey, maybe it's nothing big. Maybe because, you know, I, I was holding a stick like this and I was when I was doing it, I was crossing over my wrist. And that's why all my shots were going wide left, you know. And he, he yeah. goes, no, hold it like this. It's those little things. It's like, hey. You know what? You were, you know, I see you're cutting it close at practice. Get here five minutes earlier. Make sure you're not la the last one. You never want to be the last one out on the ice, type of thing. And and they, these do. You're right. They make huge differences. I remember if you a look, with, yeah, yeah. I remember a story with a player um, who oh, I think it was Connectney. I'm not sure. I, forget, I can't really remember, but it feels like it was Connectney. But anyway, I uh, said, so, you know, the Flyers lost the game, but Giroux had like two goals and two assists. And they went up to Claude after the game, and he was everybody's iron because the Flyers lost the game. And he went up to him and he said, "Claude, you know, good game, man. You had you were flying out there." He's like, "Don't ever tell me a good game if we lost, like just like that. That's all you got, you know." And that's like that's simple, and that's not like that's not like a big like statement, but that is what you're saying, Jeff. You know, that's that's yeah. real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. most no, definitely. It's, it's, it's a lot to it, that. It, uh, if you if you look back <laughs> on on all the beloved players from all all the teams, it doesn't matter all four sports. If you want to throw in whatever, yeah, you know whatever other sports you agree with, uh, you know, you look back and the most beloved players were not necessarily the best ones. Yeah, they were the guys that made the most impact and connected with the players. Somebody, uh, you know, on a team that was like John Cruck wasn't the best player on the Phillies. Right. Right. And he's beloved. I use this example. Right. It made me sit there and go, oh, I can play first base and hit 300 too, you know, just by his build, you know. I mean, I got the same build as him. So, you know, right. all that kind of stuff. And then all, then you hear all the stories in the locker room, how he kept everybody up and everybody loose. That kind of stuff, it, it really, it really is much more valuable than people give it credit for. Flyers have had guys like that. And there's a reason that there's a lot of Flyers who are head coaches in this league, you know, like yep. Brendan Moore, Ruby, Luke Richardson. These are all guys who, when they were in that room, were those guys, you know, and, and they mattered. They mattered, you know, to those. And it, it they, they really, and, the, you know, Richardson's not like a superstar or anything like that, Luke Richardson, but he was a hugely important player for them. Um, just it, what he did in the room, you know, Richards and Carter come, come along at the same time. Carter's got way more talent than Richards, but Richards was the more important player to the players. So, it, it, you know, it, before they both get moved out. But that's the reality, you know, like there's like a thing there. And you're right. It's, it's often those unsung guys. And, and, 
That's why, you know, the team that wins the Stanley Cup is often the team with the best fourth line. It really is. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's how, when you look at when you go down it, Great you go down point. Stanley Cups. If you look at, if you look at Stanley Cup winners, you're like, okay, that, this is the fourth line of Tampa that time. This is the fourth line of the Penguins that time. You know, this is like that, that fourth line matters. Well, I mean, you look at 2010. I mean, I thought the Blackhawks had more overall talent, but I remember Richards being quoted as, well, they had three lines, we had two. And so yeah. it was like the kind oh, of yeah. thing, yeah, both goaltenders kind of canceled out and both had yeah. really bad goals. But the Emmy made more saves and they had more depth. And it, it, it did go down to the lower level lines that were contributing that we, you know, couldn't keep up with the, the 2010 right, Blackhawks right. at least. The Chicago, the Chicago had a goalie, though. Well, the Emmy was their goalie. The Flyers had Boucher and. Um, well, yeah. Michael yeah. Layton, yeah, Michael it's, Layton, it's almost ineffable in, in, in Philadelphia. But uh, again, <laughs> looking at the later signs of things, um, is it going to be? And you might be inside word on this, and I say this uh, mm. um, with a tongue firmly in cheek. Is it going to be Danny Briere, or is it going to be Daniel Briere? You, know, <laughs> you know, like Bobby Clark to Bob Clark. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Wow, I call him Dan. I just call him Dan. So um, I don't know. I, like, I saw um, Daniel Bier, like It's when hard he to call him the... Danny. Like if you're like, hey, Danny, it's good to see you again. Like it's, for me, that's like a hard thing to do. Um, it probably will be Daniel Briere. That would be my bet. He okay. likes Daniel Briere, I think. I don't know. Actually, I actually never asked. That's a really good question. Yeah, but you know what will end up happening is ESPN will put him up there in the tracker on the bottom. It'll say Donald Briere, like, just like they messed up Chuck Taylor. <laughs> so you guys have been around for a while. I'm going to, I'm going to give you one thing that maybe, yeah, before we end really quick, I, re- I really do think is important because you guys will, and anyone who's listening out there has been a Flyers fan since like the eighties and nineties. will know what this is. Okay. So, and I, cause I was in the spectrum when this happened. All right. What was the Flyers chant? Let's but I had the Flyers chant. Let's go Flyers go back in the day. It oh, was, that's simple. Was, it was let's, yeah, go, let's Flyers. go Flyers. <laughs> let's Emphasis, go Flyers. Right. Flyers. Flyers. Let's go Flyers. Right. Yeah. One time, and they, I was in that, they homogenized I was in that, it. One time, I was in that building, and how did how did the Rangers chant go back then? Let's go Rangers! Rangers right. Let's go Rangers! Right. I was in that building right. in the in the nineties. I think it was nineties, early nineties, and the organist played that chant, da, 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 and people booed. booed, <laughs> booed. People went crazy. That's not the Flyers chant. That's the Rangers chant. So one right. thing I, I implored Danny Briere to do when I talked to him, I said, you have to change this back. Because now, because yeah. in the last like 20 years, they go, duh, duh, flyers. They hear that all the time. Uh, especially. Uh, they, they turn them into drones. With the, 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 the uniqueness of Philadelphia, each team has certain aspects or certain cultural things. And that's one of them. The emphasis, flyers. That's, the, right. that's Philadelphia. A, a, it was yep. totally different. And it was when, when it got going. It was like, let's go Flyers. It was like, it was really like something that you actually understood and that meant something. And then when I hear, when I'm in that building now and I hear the organist, or the organist goes, da, 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 da. no, it's like, that's oh. just wrong. It was like, I was at, I was in the press box, the game last, was the last week when they played the Rangers and it was nothing but a sea of blue in there. That would have yeah. never, that would have never been, you would even, even if that actually happened, the twenty percent or twenty nine percent of uh, of the crowd of the Flyers would have drowned out everything. I know, you know I that was... press box this year because of my son because I wouldn't want him to get COVID. But um, I talked to people who were there and and and, yeah. and they were just like that. It reminded them of the cap of like I used to drive down to the Cap Center to watch the Flyers play. Yes, and when you go to the Cap Center and watch the Flyers play, there would be like five thousand people in orange, you know, and three thousand yeah. people in red, white, and blue for the Caps at that time. Caps were awful. Yep. And um, and that's what the and I when I heard if, if Ed Snyder was a that's just the thing like that is, you know and I I thought of Scoop Cooper right away you know because he's like I'm like you know I I just think that that's just the most amazing thing that Ed would not have been Fletcher would have been fired the whole organization would have been fired that night like that would have been a thing that he would he would have, he would have seen that that the Rangers have come in and dominated our crowd no 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 no, no. because the big thing is not whether or not they love you or hate you, but when the Flyers fans become apathetic, yes, you're dead. That's right, because yeah. the opposite of hate is uh, is love. It's right. is not love, it's indifference. That's Everybody right. forgets that. Hate and love are, are two sides of the same coin. You got to be right. indifferent, not to, it, it, that's the opposite. Right, and, it, and, we, and we, 
me, my entire time following the Flyers organization, I only saw them get that level once. Um, and that level was when they, about the time that they traded Forsberg, they were having that horrible season, right? And then they ended up getting JVR when, you know, they were going to get Patrick Kane or whatever in the draft, but they were terrible. And that season, there was a definite apathy, that, but then it, but it went away right away. And it was like, it was like, okay, we're the, they realized it was just going to be a terrible season, but we've had like five years of it now. And yeah. that's like, that's the thing that's really, really hard. I mean, COVID hasn't helped the whole situation, of course, but it's still, it's just like, you know, I really feel bad for what, um, you know, what Carter Hart's going through right now, honestly. And I think that that's like, cause he is definitely, you got to He's, he's definitely, his character's going to be built by this a lot. Yeah. <laughs> this is a tough time. And what, one last question for me <laughs> yeah. before you jet yeah. Carter Hart. You know, if, if you're going to rebuild and you're going into this, I, I, I've said this, I would, I would, I think wherever they pick in the lottery is going to determine whether or not he stays. If, if they get a one or a two, it's possible that they can ride out three to four years with a 24 year old goalie. Uh, I think that helps expedite the process if they get a Bedard type, but uh, I, I'm just wondering. I mean, he's he's still young enough that you could still build around it, you know. And goalies at their prime at 26, 27 yeah. anymore, anyway. So right. what what would you do? I would. He's untouchable. He's he's, he's got to be untouchable. Like like we said, we, the first thing we started off this show is the Flyers. One thing they had was a goalie. They have a goalie now. Yeah, they do. They don't have anything else, <laughs> but they have a goalie. And I mean, I mean, honestly, they have very little else. But um, you can't you can't move him. He's shown that he plays. He's mentally tough to go through a, this, a season like this and still play really well. Um, I do think that it wouldn't be bad to have a veteran back him up, like more of a veteran backup because he's had like. Remember, we used to have the days of like you know we bring in like Chico Resch here to back to back up Hextall, just to give him right. like like a having like an old guy in there that that wouldn't hurt right now. Like like I was hoping they would go after like Anderson who you know is in Ottawa right now. I thought that would be a perfect fit to come bring him in. Elliot was in a way that in a way that kind of a player um you know he was a great backup for carter hart but you can't move him um and because here's the thing they're not that bad okay they 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 aren't they aren't where arizona or anaheim or san jose or chicago are you know they're they have they have some young players and they have, they've drafted some pretty good players that aren't here yet too so they have they have things coming they're in a good and they're also Philadelphia. They're also the Philadelphia Flyers. They are a prestigious place to play. They will be able to get free agents to come here. It's not impossible. You know, that's another thing that you have to remember. Like that, people love playing here. They want to play here. With as, as of now, at least, as of this point, we still are carrying on. We're still living off that old reputation. But it's work. It's still when people say the original six, they put Philly in, and it's like the original seven. You know, like this is like plus one, this is right? The, yeah, yeah, right. This is this is it. So people will play here. So. That's why I don't, that's why you can in the NHL you can rebuild quickly and I think that's why you have to keep Carter Hart. Like you you're not that far you're not that far off. Like this team is competing. And if you add a Connor Bedard to this lineup next year and another couple of good free agent signings, they're they're on the playoff bubble, maybe in the playoffs, you know. So they're only like what eight nine points out right now. So you know it's it's uh yeah they can't you don't want to get rid of Carter no way. If if he wants to sign that's the thing the the, the only and I'll I'll I'll, I'll wrap it yeah. with this. It's like this: Is he can he envision himself ending up like John Gibson in Anaheim? That that would be the only yeah. caveat for me from his perspective. It won't because this is the Flyers and not the Anaheim Ducks. Like he he also knows like this is the, the kids people growing kids growing up in Canada they realize that this is a this is a prestigious organization that will get his act together. That's what it, you know. We all have to hope that, <laughs> but it's you know we're, from where we're sitting we're like will they? But yeah, they 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 will. I mean they aren't. This is an organization that people that has a winning tradition and will have a winning tradition again, if you know, and, and they're bringing in the right people. So it's not completely without hope. The Flyers aren't without hope, and we saw this year that if they work harder, they can compete. So you know, just add some talent on top of that. Yeah, yeah, they need skill. They need. I mean, you know, Tortorella won a Stanley Cup in Tampa, but he had Le Cavier and Marty St. Louis. You know, like there's nobody like that here. You know, like it, it's not going to happen here. So. That's what they, they got to, I mean, they'll get there, but they, you know, uh, uh, Connor Bedard would be amazing. Although I like the other guy, I, I honestly like, this is the second guy in the draft. I can't remember his name. Chantilly? Yes. He is a flyer. When you watch him play, as, as Connor Bedard's obviously, you get him if you can get him. He's a superstar. He's a, he's in the McDavid world. But Fantilli is He's like Eichel, maybe. He's like in the Lindros world. 
And I think I he's a flyer. And it, when I watched him play, I'm like, that guy feels like I could just see him wearing the orange and black. Like, you can just see that. So if they get he the second He plays a flashy pick, game, I remember. I mean, looking at the WJC, I mean, he, he stood out. Yeah. He didn't, like, wasn't super productive right away. He kind of found his, his sea legs later in the tournament. But, yeah, yeah, I can see that. He's somewhere between Primo and Lindros, you know? Like, and he's yes. got that, like, at his best. Like, and he's right there, and it's really, like, he's better than Jeff Carter, um, you know, better than Chris Gratton. Like, the, but he's into <laughs> those other flyers here for the past. Ooh, but okay, you got to a little higher, Jack. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Gratton? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. But I'm thinking of guys anyway. that look like him. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, you know what he's you're definitely saying. smarter Still than Jeff Carter, by the way. He's definitely a lot smarter than Jeff Carter, so there you go. <laughs> smarter I'll than Carter. I'll take it either way. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, not that anybody doesn't really know, go to hockeybuzz.com, but and like uh, as part of your final thoughts, also, where can people find you uh, on social media and what may yeah. be coming up special uh, in I the am, offing? Yeah, thanks, I am at Eklund on Twitter um, and Instagram. Um, and hockeybuzz.com is really where I am. Um, that's, that's my home, and I'm, I'm there all the time. We do do a we do do a podcast on Dreamer like you guys are doing this one. We do that Monday through Friday with um, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. We have Kevin Allen, who's a great hockey Hall of Fame writer, oh, yeah. um, and he's on there with us every every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then Russ and Mike, Russ Cohen and Michael Jello are with me the rest of the time. And they're great. We have guests come in too. We had uh, Joe Yearden in today, but um, yeah, it's it's a fun show. It's it's a you know I think it's a it's a fun show to do every day, and then just it's, it's, it's we do a lot. And uh, right now I've got my. Uh, the best thing on hockey was I got going right now because I do after after the trade deadline I sort of like have to like rest my brain for a while because the trade deadline kills me. So what okay. I do is I um is that like I don't have enough RAM in my head to put together all the different things I'm trying to hear about. <laughs> so um so I do this prediction thing with my wife, which is really funny. And this year we're killing it, like we are absolutely destroying it. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's like we are we're something like fifty two wins and twenty losses so far, like. Wow. Since, since since the trade deadline and predicting winners. And it's insane. Like we are going every night. We've only we've had we've we've had we've done it ten nights, because there have been ten nights in the straight since the trade deadline. Done it ten nights and we've only had a losing night once, which is like So 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 this is the top left corner of like the uh the picture, like you, now you have right, a top, that's, yeah, that's my blog, right? So you click on that and then if you go and also also on the right in upper upper right you'll see like um You'll see like a hockey buzz hot topics. That also is usually where I put the just the predictions too. But the predictions are always on my blog. Um, okay. And it has, I also, did, I did this thing where my wife's a PhD, you know, electrical engineer, super whiz, whizzy, whiz kid, you know, and uh, she helped me put this, she wrote, I told her, these are, these are the 15 factors that I think go into winning hockey games. And how can we make that? How can we put that? How can we make a formula out of that? And that's what we did. And it's killing it. And it's really fun. Wow. And we're picking all kinds okay. of upsets, like crazy, the like crazy upsets that we're picking are like nuts. Um, so like we had Montreal beating Pittsburgh last night. We had Detroit beating Boston on the weekend. It's just like, it's really, really, really crazy. So right now we're flying high. I know the way these things go, I'll probably go now. I'll go, I'll go over the next 20, but you know, that's how it goes. Interesting. Yeah. That's a good little tidbit. Make, make sure you go to hockeybuzz.com and check that out on, uh, on X blog right there on the, on the site up there. Uh, yeah. thanks so much for doing this. Thanks for having, thanks, thanks for asking me to come on guys. It's, yeah, it was it's great. Been here. A big fan of your podcast, and I'm really, I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Oh, fantastic! And uh, we'll have to get you yeah. back on the off season, and maybe the Flyers will make us, uh, you know, Anytime. break some things, things break their way. Thanks. It's always fun to talk Flyers. Anytime. All uh, right, you take care. Okay, I hate kicking people. I like when they leave, and I don't feel so bad. So awesome! That was very fun. Yeah, that was one of one of the more fun ones. We kept it a little loose, and, and we got some good insight, too. Yeah, yeah. I noticed he didn't want to get too deep into the whole for the Dave Scott thing, and I, I wasn't yeah. going to push it. Yeah, and I, and I respect that. You know, that's like when you ask for some insight, there's a trade-off there. So I, oh, yeah. I, I definitely respect that. So, okay, before we wrap for this particular uh, OMB podcast special, just want to get your opinion on a couple things. TK and Sean Couturier may return this year, or it might just be too late because the Flyers don't have enough games left. Uh, to, uh, I guess Couturier really is the big question. TK, we don't really need to know anything more. 
yeah. TK, it's like if it's if it's close, forget it because I don't need him screwing up his shoulder or whatever he's got going on. Uh, what about Sean Couturier? I could see the benefit uh, with 15 games left to play. If, if they could get him in at least uh, five to seven games. And, of course, Sean himself weighed in on why he wanted to do just that. Yeah, I, I think he kind of – like before I was hesitant thinking it was a, a lost season, but we, there's a lot of these players that haven't played with Sean. So I think it's probably beneficial to probably get a little wisdom in. So I, th- I think – Look, Noah Cates could probably – he did a great job on face-offs. I think he won 7 or 11 the other night. Now imagine, you know, if, if he's learning something like that off of Sean on the ice. I think it could even benefit. So I, I kind of like I'm flip-flopping on it, and I know I am, but I wouldn't mind seeing him in like 7 to 10 games by the end of the season just to show that, hey, prove to everybody, yeah, look, I can still play. And two, to get – you know, just just to get some experience – here, here's a part. Here's a part of that knowledge that we talked about just briefly on the show that of showing the younger kids and how you need some of those rah rah guys. I'm not saying he's a rah rah guy, but he's definitely got skills that he could show some of these young players. Yeah, I mean rah rah guy. It's kind of I guess it evokes different things to different people. I guess like a leader by example, or someone yeah. who knows when to speak up. It's all the same category. I think everyone's got a different way of putting it. And certainly you've been pretty clear through the years. That you want someone to come in there and show people the right way, however, you know, whatever their style is, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I think the other thing I just want to touch on just a few things. I, I kind of disagree with Kevin last show about Brent Flair. I think the Flyers feel better about him than maybe Kevin did. I think Kevin felt like, nah, you know, it, it's so late in the game scouting wise, there's no point in saying anything iffy about Brent Flair because you're not going to change the horses this late, <laughs> you know, in the race when it comes to scouting. You know what I mean? He's going to be with the yeah. team until, you know, the draft. And then, of course, a decision will be made. And, of course, also at that time, the president of hockey operations will be here and they'll be part of that decision. But it, it does sound like more that he would be here in some capacity rather than not. What 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 vibes are you picking up? I, I You know what? If you look, I think from what, well, everything I've researched and seen out there, like speaking to other people too, it, it seems to be he was always more of the guy that like looks at uh, looks at the talent draft, the drafting person more so than Chuck was. So uh, if if that's the case, then I have my reservations. But I also see, I, I know I I think Danny likes him from what I've read too. It gets along with him, find it fair enough. But I I think it'll it'll. We'll see. I, I think he could be – it's 50-50. He could be here or he could be gone. But I'm leaning towards more of the part that that they're probably going to find a home for him. It's somewhere in the scouting department. Right. And, you know, maybe he could replace somebody like Dave Brown. I'm not pushing – I think the Flyers' amateur scouting is actually among the stronger parts of the organization. And then there's, there's development, which has been under criticism, and there have been – moves made to try to remedy that i would say this also and something bill Meltzer alluded to he said that at some point chuck fletcher has had so many opportunities with different organizations he's failed pretty much with two organizations maybe brent flair wants to make a big play to stay here and separate himself and establish his own brand away from Chuck at this point. That that would seem to me to be more more likely the case. It's just a matter of whether uh, Daniel Briere <laughs> or her and whoever is the president of hockey operations agrees with that. Yeah. Yeah, that could be it too. I mean, we've all taken, you know, taken jobs that there were temporary jobs just to, you know, get your mental game back or your footing back, some something that kind of wasn't tasking or or too hard for what you were used to doing to, to recoup. So yeah, it's not out of the realm of possibility. And I think it might actually be wise for him. Yeah. I, I, I think for a career move, it certainly would be two last things. One, I think we go all, all going to tankathon.com. When I originally ran the model, 
I got to number two on the fifth try. But then after last night's game, I went back and on my second try, the Flyers were number one. So yeah. you have to go to tankathon.com and have a little fun. And if you can freeze frame and, you know, do a screenshot of the Flyers at number one or number two, at least, so we can get Fantilli, if that's the guy they like, for all I know, the Flyers like Mishkov, or they could like Leo Carlson, although I do think it's probably one of, if, after Bedard is one tier, then it's between Mishkov and Fantilli, and then maybe Carlson is like a notch below them. That would be my draft board with what I'm aware of right now. So yeah. it, it, we're going to have somebody to talk about that um, closer to the draft. But before the yeah. before the lottery, like to me, it's like, what's the point of us talking about it? Because people really haven't drilled down yet. Yeah. No, no, so. no. It, it's good. That's part of the the fun of the the playoffs when you're watching all the teams. It, it's 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 the only playoffs aside from maybe football that I'll watch all the games, whoever's on, because I think that they're all – hockey is just another level when you get to the playoffs. And 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 the draft, the, the draft lottery is part of that now. So I do enjoy that part of it. So, Yeah, exactly. And, and I think that they announced when they were uh, picking for the draft lottery because I had the GM meetings and they were talking about different things – the new league rules and things like that. And one of the thing, one of the topics they covered was the date of the draft lottery. It's May the eighth, so that will be the big day that the draft lottery will happen. And of course, you'll see it on Twitter because there'll be a split second delay with watching it yeah. and <laughs> all that craziness. And you'll see somebody tweet it out, even though everybody's watching, because now Thanks. everybody streams everything. <laughs> you have uh, to know the very second. Yeah. So, no, but I get it. So, all right. So I'm going to leave you with one last thing. Okay. Because the Flyers are going to play a back-to-back at the Wells Fargo Center on Friday and Saturday. And of course, as we're recording that, we're probably this, you're probably listening to this on Friday morning, because that's where, where it's going to be the release. I don't know if the Flyers are going to be able to beat the Sabres who are still in the playoff picture. That's a team that's on the come. And, of course, Carolina, one of the best teams in the entire league. But, you know, they're at home for several games. I think that seven in a row they played one, so six more, I believe, is the total. I received information that was an opinion. It was not information about what's going to happen. But a very well-regarded person in the scouting world that most people who are rabid NHL fans know who they are, gave me a very strong recommendation for the Flyers to hire Chris Pronger. Thinks he has all the attributes to do the job and compliment Daniel Briere. So just for what that is worth, that doesn't mean that the Flyers are listening, nor does it mean that it's likely to happen. But since Chris Pronger's name was was thrown out there, and if you're really not sure, like what qualifications? Remember, he worked for the league. He he was in Florida, and he made a good impression. He's his wife has a business in St. Louis. Almost, he might be entrenched there as much as Shane Doan is in Arizona. So that you know, we might be talking at a at a school or at a turn, however you want to put it. So just thought I'd let you know that the Flyers did go in that direction. There's some people who are the lot of league connections who would think very highly of that. And I'll leave it right there. So yeah. Chef, uh, what's the last word you got for us before we call the night? My last word is just have fun with Tankathon and seeing, you know, and tweet at us, man. How many times you get the Flyers one or two, just just tweet it at us. I would love to see it. I've gotten it three times already. So I'm, I'm during the show. I was like all ecstatic. So yeah, we got it. We got it. so, but you can uh, you know, tweet at us and uh, in particular me, Chef to Left B, Chef uh, the number two to the left B, and I'll look forward to hearing from you. Fantastic. And you can follow me, Isaiah, I-S-A-I-A-H underscore 520. Isaiah, don't forget the underscore 520 on Twitter. 
And then you can follow the OMB Puckcast at OMB Puck, at OMB Puck on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We have a YouTube page and our backup plan getter at OMB Puckcast, at OMB Puckcast. We should be back sometime next week talking about some of these uh, results and some of the events and more news about the offseason. But until then, everybody, take care.